In this tutorial, we are going to go from A to Z in Aurora, meaning that we will start off with a project address and end with a homeowner friendly web proposal that clearly summarizes the details of the solar design that you've created for that homeowner. Here we are on the page that you will see when you log into Aurora, the project index or the list of the projects that you've created. You have some options for filtering this list, either based on projects that are yours, projects that are archived, other filters include type or status, and you can also search by keyword to filter. This list displays the name of the project, the customer or the homeowner that you are creating the design for, status of project, when it was last edited, who the owner is within your Aurora environment, and you also have the option to archive or delete the project from this view. Some other navigation tips on this project index page include clicking the Aurora button in the upper left to always go back to this view, the list of your projects. You also have our Aurora Support Center available within the app by clicking this question mark button. This will bring up this dialog, which gives you the option to navigate to an announcement section, a get started section, which includes in-app help tutorials, kicking off a live chat with a support representative, or browsing the support articles available in our help center. And I did wanna highlight, if you go and click through to our in-app help tutorials using get started, it will show you any tutorials available for the current view that you are seeing in Aurora. So a great place to go if you find yourself stuck um, in the view that you are in. Go ahead and close out of this. And I think we are ready to take a look at setting up our Aurora environment using the Aurora database and the Aurora settings section. This is very important because we want to make sure that your Aurora environment is set up to accurately reflect the types of projects that you are designing and working on in the field. So we'll go and click on our username in the upper right and go ahead and navigate over to our Aurora database. Very quickly, we'll call out here. If I go to the in-app support center and get started, I can see in-app help tutorials that are available to me for this view. Here we are in our Aurora database. And the first thing to call out is this slider next to generation here, unlocked or locked. Unlocked means that any component within Aurora's database is potentially available for use in your designs. So it's a bit of a free for all. We recommend setting this to locked and then enabling specific components, whether these are solar modules or panels, inverters or DC optimizers, based on what you're actually using on your jobs. This will make sure that you're designing with the right components and getting the most accurate estimates of production possible. So let's go ahead and enable a few of these. I will unselect the sample here and we'll select a couple of panels for demonstration. Grab here as well as an LG. And then we'll do something similar for inverters. I'll deselect the sample. And we'll grab a string inverter and a micro inverter. And lastly, we will do this for our DC optimizers as well to make sure we have one available to use with the string inverter that I selected. If you're not seeing a component here in our database that you're using on jobs, you can click this Request Custom Component button, which will allow you to attach a PDF spec sheet for that component and send it along to our team who can get it added to the database for you. Now that we've selected some components to use in our projects, let's go down to jurisdictions. Jurisdictions is where we can configure setback requirements at the state or local level in Aurora. 
And this is important to make sure that your designs are in compliance with local code and that you're not placing two panels too close to roof edges or obstructions in your designs. I'm going to go ahead and add a state level jurisdiction here. We'll rename it as California default. Tell it that it is for California, which means it will apply these to any project with an address in California. And I'm going to put in some requirements here for demonstration purposes. Please always check with your local authorities to make sure that you have their requirements accurately reflected in Aurora. But here I'm just putting in that panels must be one and a half feet from eaves, three feet from ridges, and half a foot from obstructions. I can enter any building or design notes if desired. And this is auto saved, so there's no need to click a save button or do anything else here. At this point, I'll move over into my system settings and illustrate some key things to review here as you're getting your Aurora environment set up. First, we'll go into general under organization. And here you can enter any information about your business. This, you can also enter default currency and units for your projects, as well as customize project statuses if you're using Aurora for any sort of project lifecycle management. And lastly, you can update your primary company colors and upload your logos. Uploading the logos is quite simple to do. You just click on it here and it will pull up the files on your system. You select the file and it will upload it from your hard drive. Under billing, you can look at the card on file if you have a subscription account and the billing details there. Under on-demand services, we'll spend a bit of time here talking about some add-on services that are available through Aurora. The first is near map imagery, which are high definition satellite images for projects that you may be working on. And you do have the ability to add credits so that you can use these for your projects. It can be a nice way just to make sure that you're working with the latest and greatest as far as imagery, or really providing that wow factor when you show the imagery to your customer. 3D modeling service is available through Aurora. And this is where our design team will create the roof and site design for your project within three hours or less with expedited service available. This can be a great solution if you're looking at a particularly difficult roof or you just press for time and your time would be better spent doing other things than designing that roof. Our team is happy to do that for you. Their designs are excellent and you can add credits for that right here in the app. Users and licenses will allow you to manage your users within your account. And you can do things like change the permissioning um, or associated contact information here. Let's take a look at our pricing section. Under general, we have the ability to add a default base cost per watt to be applied to all projects in Aurora. And what I'll do here is I will add a default of $2.75 per watt just as a, as a base for any project that I create in Aurora. We'll see later how these can be updated. Starting cost would be any fixed cost that gets applied to the price of every design. So a way to default a fixed cost to all of your designs, if you have something like a project fee or a site fee, it might go here, but we'll just leave it blank for now. I do want to talk about adders and discounts because this is a very powerful way to customize how you price your projects. We can illustrate this by creating one. We'll call this um, fall discount. We'll choose whether it's an adder or a discount. Um, it's subtracting from the price, so it will be a discount. And we can choose how it works. Is it on a flat basis, percentage basis, per watt basis, or per panel basis? We'll do this on a percentage basis, let's say 10%. And sliding to allow inline edit does allow this to be changed when it is applied on a per project basis. And we will allow this for this particular discount. I'll go ahead and save that, and that will be available to me later on. Let's take a look at our design settings under application. These are important to review. Because if you are using Aurora's auto designer, and this is basically our max fit functionality, especially in sales mode, 
the settings here will impact how Aurora places panels for you. And you want to make sure that the defaults here make sense based on the sorts of projects that you work on. These are all nicely defined right here, so you can see exactly how they apply. And the one that I will change here is minimum solar access, because I want to make sure that Aurora's Auto Designer isn't placing panels in areas that aren't getting enough sun. I'll set this at 75% just to make sure we're not placing panels on any shaded areas of a roof. If you are working with ground mounts in Aurora, you can see that there are default settings for how those designs work here. And again, these are all nicely detailed, so you know how they would apply and can adjust them as needed. We do recommend reviewing these, um, all of these design settings, just to make sure, again, that they reflect the sorts of projects that you're working on. Default financing settings allows you to set up default parameters for how Aurora's financial modeling and analysis works. This includes project life, whether utility bill savings or feed-in tariffs are taxable, very uncommon, as well as system and maintenance costs can be set here. And finally, our discount rate. We can also set the default discount rate using our projects. The discount rate is here to account for the fact that I can save $100 on my utility bill next month, and that's probably worth just about $100 to me. I can save $100 on my utility bill in 25 years, and that's worth something to me, but it's probably not exactly $100. This is due to the fact that a lot can happen between now and the next 25 years. We have things like inflation, we have things like uncertainty, and the discount rate is here to account for that fact. It's set as a default to 5%, and you can also modify it on a per project basis as desired. Under project default settings, we can set a default utility rate escalation for all projects in Aurora. This is due to the fact that utility rates just tend to go up over time. We'll set this at three. And you also have the ability to set this based on the state. And I am going to add one here for California. And we'll call it 4% because maybe our utilities are a little aggressive. And so this means that for projects created in California, the system will apply this 4% utility rate escalation rather than the system default of 3%. Income tax rates usually do not apply for residential customers. This, they would only apply in the case where you have local rebates or incentives that are taxable, but we will leave them zero here. And move on to our last section, which is performance simulations. And under performance simulations, we can review the settings for how Aurora is calculating system production and losses for your designs. Simulation setting set to auto means that Aurora will use the Aurora simulation engine if there are inverters present in your design or the PV watts simulation engine if inverters are not present. I do recommend setting use LiDAR shading to green or yes, so that Aurora uses the LiDAR data set available for that address to generate how local obstructions on the site, such as trees, would impact how much sun is hitting the roof. We'll take a look at how this works later, but it will save you a lot of time if you set this to green and you're not having to draw trees. There are other systems settings available here that you can review when it comes to Aurora simulation model, the PV watt simulation model, as well as specific system losses um, that are used by default in your projects. The ones that we generally recommend looking at here would be things like soiling or snow if you're working in areas where those are really going to impact your system production. And this estimated total loss tells us, based on my defaults here, what I would be looking at on average as far as system losses from these particular types. With that, I think we have our Aurora system pretty well configured, and we can go ahead and jump into the fun part, which is creating a project. So let's go back to our project index, hit the plus project here, and enter in the address that we'd like to model. I'm going to use this Santa Ana address. We want to make sure that the pin is placed over the house we'd like to model. We can see here that this house has a pool. This will come into play later, but a good thing to note. We can go ahead and create the project. 
here we are on the overview page for this project. You can see it's defaulted to naming this project based on the address. I can change this for my purposes. I also have the ability, rather than an address, to enter in coordinates when I create a project, which is a good thing to know. This is my project dashboard. I can see, I can enter information about this customer, their name, phone, or email, but I have the opportunity to do this later, so I will leave it blank for now. The next thing I can take a look at is entering the energy consumption for this particular address. I can also do this later on, but it, let's take a look at doing it here. What this allows you to do is look at the utility rate that has been pulled in by default through our generability integration, the escalation rate, which has been pulled in from our system settings, and you can see it's applied the California specific rate. I have the ability to set a post solar rate here if I desire, and then I can enter my usage. And I have a few different options for doing this. I can enter an average monthly bill, I can enter an average monthly energy usage, or I can enter up to 12 months of either bills or energy. Well, let's just enter an average monthly energy usage of 1200 kilowatts for this particular house. We can see that this maps to a bill of $372.07 per month. That's based on the rate that we're using. And then down here, I can look at my estimated load profile for this house. I have some parameters here that I can set that will impact how energy is used over the period of the day. And I can also add an appliance, in this case, a pool, just to make sure that it's being reflected in the load profile. And what's happened here is that the system is saying it knows that we're using, on average, 1,200 kilowatt hours per month, and that includes a pool. This is how the load profile will look. I can enter an electric vehicle here as well. But now that we have some idea of how power is being consumed at this address, we can go back to our dashboard. And we can go ahead and get started designing either from this view here or from our designs view here. If I go into my design view, I have the option to request that this property be modeled by our 3D modeling team. or I can go ahead and create a design myself, which I will be doing for this demonstration. Here we are in our Aurora design view. It is loading up the local imagery and LiDAR data. And now we can go ahead and get started designing in Aurora. Some navigation tips that I like to cover first, if you are using a mouse, which I highly recommend, you can use the mouse scroll wheel to zoom in and out. You can click that mouse scroll wheel and drag around to pan, or you can click your right mouse button, and this allows you to rotate either in 2D or eventually once we have the model in 3D. You can also see that these controls are available in the bottom right of the screen. So if I don't have a mouse, I can still navigate around. The next thing I'll usually do is take a look at the different imagery that's available to me for this site. And you can do that using this down here. It's pulled in Google Maps HD. I also have standard Google Maps, big maps, and the ability to apply a near map credit if I desire, or to upload custom imagery, which might be used in the case where I have drone imagery or there's actually no construction built yet, but I do have blueprints that I can upload and design off of. Well, let's take a look at Google Maps and see how it compares to Google HD. It actually looks pretty good. I'd say the lines are a little cleaner on this roof. Let's see what Bing looks like. Bing is probably not our best option. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and use my Google Maps to design here. And the next thing I'll do is use this map split button. And what this does, I'm going to go ahead and hide this by clicking this little arrow, is it will show me in this other pane here, satellite imagery of this property. And it gives me the ability to rotate around 
which is very handy because it just helps me get a sense of this site from some different angles. I can see where the different roof edges fit together. I can see in this case, it looks like, I believe this is a garage piece on the side here. It's a separate structure and it's slightly lower than the main structure. And I also have Google Street View, which if it's available, gives me a front view of this property. And I can do things like check the pitch. This looks like a pretty standard pitch. I can also confirm, get over here, that in fact, the garage is slightly lower than the main building. And also that we have these kind of uh, cut out cut out pieces here um, on the roof. So that's something that I'll model. So that map split can be a really nice way, again, of getting the lay of the land. I'll click map split again to get rid of it because I think I have a pretty good idea of what's going on with this site. And I can go ahead and start modeling the roof. So what I will do is I will go make sure I'm under site, which is creating my site model. So this is the 3D model of the building, any obstructions on that roof um, and any trees if needed, although hopefully we won't, we won't need to draw any trees here. And I will go to smart roof pitch because we're working with a pitched roof. And I'm going to draw out the first, this main section here, because I could tell because this one's at a different height, it actually makes sense to draw them separately. So what I'll do is grab my first corner here, pull this over straight as I can. And once I've drawn one line, it's going to give me these dotted line guides, which will help me snap to square, which is really important, making sure that um, by, you know, my building is actually square. Uh, I can't really see this corner here because of the shading from the tree, but I'm going to guess it lines up pretty much with that edge there. So I'll kind of eyeball this as best I can. Let's see, I did okay. So uh, use my undo button. See if I can get a little closer. That's pretty good. Um, go up to this corner here come across to this corner and I'm really using these guides just to make sure everything is snapping to square and kind of model this little cutout section here. And there we go. So what smart roof does is every time I click, it drops a node and every time it has a node, it's going to draw a separate roof face. And this works very nicely when you're modeling out these little cutouts here. And we'll see in a second how you can, how you can update this a bit um, because it sometimes will actually draw extra faces that aren't needed. But this piece is looking pretty good. And you can see it's applied the setbacks that I specified in my database. So it's saying that I can't place panels a foot and a half from an eave edge or within three feet of a ridge. What I'll do next is draw this garage piece here. So we'll draw another smart roof pitched. We'll grab a corner, come across, and these are actually merged together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this right up until where I can see that these different pieces come together, something like that. And again, just come over, snap to square, and there we go. And you can see what smart roof has done here is I clicked four times because this is a rectangle, and it's actually created four faces. But I know that this face on the back doesn't actually exist. So what I'll do is I'll select it and I can either hit my delete key or I can go over here to the side and click on this one, which will unpitch it. And that should be more like how this building is actually designed. So I've now rotated over in 3D and you can see what's been created. This main piece looks pretty good here. You can see I have that cutout I was seeing, but the garage actually isn't at a lower height. Than the main building. So we're going to need to adjust the height. A great way to do that is to take a look at our LiDAR data. And what LiDAR is, is it's an aerial vehicle that's flown overhead and it pings down all the time and then it measures the time it takes for that ping to come back. And what that gives you is a data set of basically the height of everything that's on the ground. If you like, you can go into LiDAR settings and you can select point cloud and this will actually show you all of the pings. So you can see we did a pretty good job for this piece here, but this one here is well above all the pings. So what I've done here is I've selected it and I can change the height of this structure either by using my height to roof base, my stories inputs here, or I can actually just click my arrow and drag this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag until I'm right at the level of my LiDAR data. And that looks pretty good. I also have the ability to fit my buildings to the LiDAR data set. You can see that's available here. 
I'll do that for this one. So you can see here that now this is actually matching the, the line where I can see that they're intersecting. And we do have this garage structure at a lower height than the main building. So I think that's looking pretty good. And what I can do next here is make sure that I draw the obstructions on this roof. And the reason that you want to do this is in some cases, like a chimney, the obstruction will actually create shade. You want to make sure that you're taking that into account when you're designing your solar system. And then you also can't place a panel on top of an obstruction or in some cases within a certain distance of an obstruction. So we just want to make sure that these are accounted for in our design. So I can see here that looks like a chimney. Um, these look like maybe little um, vents that are flush. Same here. Um, these are maybe circular vents, but they're within a setback anyway, so we won't worry about them. And then there are a bunch of smaller ones that we won't worry about um, just for demonstration purposes here because we're not going to be placing panels here. So I'm not going to worry too much uh, about any obstructions, but I do want to make sure I get these ones, this one, and the chimney. So I'll go over here to obstructions. I'm going to choose a rectangle for the chimney and just draw it out. It's going to default it to a height of 3.3 feet. I have the ability to set this flush, but since I know that this is a chimney, I will leave it as is. You can see it's modeled it like so, and it actually, I think, would cast a shadow pretty similar to that. And let's get these little vents here. I'll draw these out as little rectangles like that. I'll make sure I set it to flush. And then I can detect similar obstructions. And since there's another one of these, let's go ahead and hit this detect and see what it brings up. All right, so let's, hit, let's grab that other one and save me the effort of copying and pasting it or drawing it again. And I know that this one is very similar. It's just oriented in a different way. So I will copy and paste. I will place it over here. And then I'll just rotate it around like so. And I think that should be pretty good. And I can see we've got a very small one here as well. We'll do something like that. And I think we have covered our main obstructions on this roof. So at this point, we have our 3D model of this building. We have the obstructions modeled out. We've applied our setbacks. And what we can do now is get a sense of how much sun is hitting this roof. Because I've turned on LiDAR shading, in this case, I can look at my LiDAR data and I can see that these trees on this site are definitely here. And I can go ahead and run my irradiance analysis and it should take these trees into account when it does that so there won't be the need to draw them so let's go ahead and click on irradiance what this does is it traces out the path of the sun 24 hours a day 365 days a year and it's going to tell us how much sun is hitting hitting these different roof faces which in turn will tell us which roof faces are good candidates for placing solar panels so in fact even without drawing our tree here, we can see that there is significant shading in this corner from that tree. Otherwise, this all looks about as expected. Uh, north, north facing roof faces, not getting as much sun. We do have some shading from this chimney that we've drawn here. And I think this pretty much tells us what we need to know in order to start placing some panels. Have my roof drawn and my building design, some obstructions placed on the roof, and a good idea of how much sun is hitting these different roof faces. I can go ahead and place some solar panels, design my PV system. I have a few different options for doing this here in Aurora. We'll go over into our design area or our system area of the design and see the different options. The first that comes up here is Auto Designer. And what Auto Designer allows you to do is choose either a max fit scenario. So this is just going to place as many panels as it can based on your specifications here, or an energy target scenario. And we'll demonstrate the energy target scenario. Set this to 95%. So this tells me that I want the solar system to produce enough energy so that I have a 95% offset on this home's energy use. I can choose either portrait or landscape or auto um, for the orientation. Choose the panels I'd like to use. Here I'll select my solar edge string inverter. I know that I need a, a DC optimizer for that particular inverter, and I can run Auto Designer.
And what it's doing is it's just running all these calculations to make sure that it can place panels so that it meets that energy target of about 95% offset. But let's go ahead and run my performance simulation here. And we'll see what sort of offset we get. All right, so it's designed an 8.86 kilowatt system and we are at 93% production offset, um, very close to that 95% that I specified. I can click this little down arrow to see more detail um, about the output of my simulation, including annual production. There's my 93% offset. Here I have the um, consumption versus production monthly. And I can go into advance, see the system losses that have been calculated. I can also go to utility bill savings and see pre and post solar. What does that monthly utility bill look like? I'm going to use my control Z button here or my undo button to go back and show another option for placing panels, which is a bit more manual, but can be useful. And that is going to insert panels and modules. And here I can choose uh, which module I'd like to use. Do I want to lay these out in a portrait or landscape orientation? Keep this portrait. Um, in this case, let's specify a micro inverter. I'll use that end phase. And I can also choose um, specifications like tilt on roof, rotation, any spacing, or minimum solar access. Let's set this to 80% just to make sure we're not placing panels anywhere that's not getting a lot of sun. And I'll click on fill roof face and then just click on the roof face I'd like to fill. And there we go. It has placed those panels with those micro inverters as many as it can on this roof face. Do that again. on these faces that look like they're good candidates for solar panels. So that's gotten me to a 9.63 kilowatt system. I can run my simulation again. And now I'm actually at 98% production, so that I'm a 98% energy offset with a 91% bill savings. So a bit higher um, because I had um, I had set the auto designer to 95%, and here I was manu manually placing these panels. We ended up with a few more. I'm going to hit my undo once again, and now show you a different way of adding panels to your design. And we will do this by opening sales mode. And this will walk us through some very streamlined steps to finish our design for this address, enter some pricing information, and then produce a web proposal that you can share with this homeowner. So let's open up sales mode. And it's going to prompt me here for the homeowner's first and last name and any contact information about them. Uh, we hadn't added this yet, so I'll go ahead and add it in here. Let's say this is going to Selena Solar. I'm not going to enter a phone or email, but you can easily add those in. And we'll start our sales mode flow. So you can see here it's pulled in the energy usage information that we entered earlier on. This can be a good chance um, to check it, to make any updates if you need to, especially if you're doing this live with the homeowner. Uh, you can show them how you have um, modeled their current bills and see if any updates need to be made here. And it's also nice you can display what this looks like over 25 years. So that's quite a large number. I think usually resonates pretty well. Uh, if we're feeling good about how we've modeled out current utility consumption, we can go ahead into our next screen here. And now it is time to design our system. And sales mode provides a really streamlined way of doing this. So we can see here the roof model uh, that I built previously. Go ahead and go into next, and this is going to pull up the model and provide me with a means to place panels to design my solar system. Now, if I hadn't already built this model, there would be nothing here. I wouldn't be able to place panels, but what I do have is the ability to request an expert design. So that would be a good flow um, if you haven't had the chance to go in um, and and actually model out the roof yet, or that's not something that you're needed to do for this project, you can request that for your design uh, from sales mode as well. But since we have the model here already, we can go ahead and click this icon to add solar panels. 
And similarly, I'm going to select my cues from before. Uh, let's keep these. Let's keep these in portrait and go ahead and place. And what it's going to do is it's going to max fit these panels based on those um, design settings that we were looking at previously. So you can see it's actually avoided um, this area with shading because I had set that minimum solar access threshold. But it does pretty much place panels anywhere else it can fit them, including, as we'll see here, you can click on this to see additional display options on northern roof faces uh, where there just isn't as much sun. And so generally what your next step might look like here is going in and removing panels that, um, that are in areas where you wouldn't necessarily install them. And in sales mode, this is a pretty simple process. You can click on any panel and that will actually remove the, the entire array. So this was an array of two and they are grayed out so they're no longer active. I'm gonna do that for all of my Northern faces here. And then maybe, um, you know, you also have the ability to add and remove individual panels. That's a longer click. Maybe I don't want these on the end here um, with that obstruction in the way. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to install that way. So I'm going to do my long clicks and these are grayed out as well. And then I can recalculate irradiance. Go ahead and just recalculate um, my production simulation. So this will tell me what is the output of the system that I've designed. All right, so the system I've designed gives me 110% energy offset, uh, which is um, on the larger side, but I think is pretty good to go with here. Um, we have a little extra padding in case those bills go up in the future. So I think I can go ahead and go to my next screen, which gives me a nice overview of the impact of um, of this, this solar system on this roof. This is something that's very nice you can display for the homeowner if you're sitting here and doing this live with them. Uh, makes you know makes the impact of this feel very real. The next thing that we see is a breakdown of utility bills, uh, both the current, so it's about three hundred seventy-two dollars a month. In twenty-five years, this is one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars, and then with solar, this drops down to about thirteen fifty per month. Um, and your twenty-five year total is a lot lower. So I think a pretty compelling vision here. You can also drop bring up this nice little graphic, which just shows the difference. Um, between your bill with and without solar and your bill without solar just going up a lot over time. And I think really lays it out clearly the benefit of getting these panels installed on this roof. And that comes to a total cost of $29,645. I can see that my uh, residential renewable energy tax credit, this is the federal income tax credit, 26%, has been applied here. And I can also see uh, summary of the system that I've designed, 28 panels, and 10.78 kilowatt system. What I can do next is adjust my pricing for this project. So I'll go in here to adjust. And maybe I want to keep my cost per watt the same, $2.75. But I know that I have this fall discount, 10% uh, discount running. And so I can add this discount. Click done. It's now included that 10% fall discount for a total cost of $26,681. And you can actually see here a more detailed breakdown of how the pricing is working. So we have a base cost per watt, and then we have a cost per watt, including um, any adders, discounts, and incentives. And so we're down, you know, we've gone from $2.75 base down to about $2.48 with that 10% fall discount. At this point, if you have Aurora Contract Manager, you can go on to this purchase system um, next step and generate an e-signature ready customized contract package that you can send along to your prospect via email. We won't look at that today, but what we can do, let's go here, which this gives us our sales mode menu. So all the different screens that we just walked through, the ability to return to the project overview. So the main design area in a and then also this little paper airplane button here. Clicking this will give you the link that you can share with your homeowner. So that they can see a web proposal view of what you've created for them. So we can see it's pulled in Selena Solar's first name, their address, and we have a nice flow that they can revisit if they want more information about what you're proposing 
There's a nice um, system design here that they can interact with. There's a nice summary of what this means in terms of system size, energy production, energy offset. We see a summary of the savings that they should expect based on the system's production over 25 years. And this again is interactive, so you can see what this looks like in 10 years, uh, 20 years, 25 years. Details about the proposal, including the sort of system that you've designed, any discounts, um, any incentives that are applied, and the total they would expect to see in cash for the system. And then finally, they have the option to reach out and get in touch if they are interested in learning more and getting these panels on the roof. So now we've gone from entering an address into Aurora to this customized web proposal that you can share with your prospect or homeowner. I hope this has been helpful and happy designing in Aurora.